together and creating things. So you have then God working as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in every time and every occasion, part of what the season of Epiphany is designed for us to be thinking about is the ways in which you are going to meet God in a variety of means, in a variety of ways, both as <coughs> brooding, as word, and as creating. And at Jesus' baptism, what was spoken to him was of the essential nature of all of that activity of God, planted in all of creation. You are mine, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And that is the master message for you who have been baptized in whatever fashion you have been baptized. I know we were talking in adult Bible study a little bit about all the different ways that people can fight about the proper Christian baptism. Is it as an infant? Is it as an adult? Is it as a believer's baptism? Take your pick. In the New Testament, every one of those is present, up to and including the fact of people who are baptized who aren't sure exactly what they believe. You saw that in the second reading today, where the apostles have to go then to Samaria itself after the people there were baptized to give them the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift of creating, the gift of imagination, and the gift of wisdom. And that is all part of the package that God gives to you when he says to you, you are my beloved, I love you. I'm pleased with you. So, if you're having a point in your life where you think you are lower than a snail trail, and life just ain't working for you too good, and you're not feeling so hot about yourself or anything going on in your life, that is a word of life, of creativity, of hope to you who are in need of a word of good news. You are my beloved. I love you. That is the master meaning and message of baptism, regardless of the style and the age in which it was done. When you understand that, you understand then the love which God has for you. Now the other piece in here, of course, is that there's a lot of graphic language in the, in the gospel reading this morning. Uh, you can get the scene right on the banks of the Jordan River, are people just gathering. They're just hovering, wondering what's going on. They're the bystanders. They're the ones who are just wanting to say, okay, this is interesting, but I don't want to get over-invested in any of, these, of this kind of stuff. I'm just going to watch. What's mine is mine. What is yours is yours. You live your life, I'll live mine. Then you have the other people who, for whatever reason, are taking the dip and the plunge into the middle of the Jordan River. And those are the people who recognize that their lives are not exactly what they had hoped they were going to be or what they thought they would, would be, or what they thought they sh it should be. They're the ones who are measuring what is with what they think it should be. And so they come into the Jordan River, and they're baptized by John with a repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, repentance is a fancy Christian word. Uh, whenever you, those of you who teach in preschool, those of you who have young children, who say something along the lines of, or who have a husband. 
<laughs> You're taking a time out. <laughs> Go to the garage. Now that would be for your husband. <laughs> your preschool, you're taking a time out. Come over here. That is the understanding, one of the major ones, of what it means to be a repentant person. You recognize in your own life that there's things going on, pieces in it that you are not pleased with, that it's not working very well for you, and you're taking a time out. You're buying time, backing away. Maybe going, and that's uh, part of what the monks talk about uh, when they talk about solitude and the importance of silence, the importance of being alone and the value of it, is so that you can have some buying of time <laughs> to evaluate and re-estimate and rethink the meaning of your life and its purpose. And so all of that occurs in the idea and the act of repentance. Uh, when, uh, John was baptizing for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, sin is not just simply and solely a private individual affair. We do that, and I can't get so aggravated because it's only when there is an election coming up every two years that all of a sudden people start talking about sin. And it's always the political parties that are talking about sin. And there's only ever three sins. And I won't go into them because I'll just get too irritated and aggravated. But there's only ever three sins in the political concept of things. Simplicity and ignorance guides people that way. But when John was offering a forgiveness of sin, sin is not just an internal movement of the spirit or the heart. It is also a social manifestation that occurs in the real world, in your workplace in your home, in your driving, in the grocery store. Think about it for a minute. Have you ever gotten through a day, and if you haven't ever thought about it, it'll be time now. Have you ever gotten through a day where you have not sinned against somebody? <laughs> or they have not sinned against you. It would be something along the lines of, you're in Mr. Z's. Or ShopRite, sorry, want to be equal. Hit somebody with a shopping cart. Egalitarian. <coughs> and somebody cuts you off in the veggie aisle. My God, you're ready to rip them a new one if you're in a hot hurry. And then two aisles over, what do you do? You're blasting through trying to get through when you cut around them and you bang into their cart and knock it over into the uh, can. And keep on going, and you know that she's or he's looking at you with a hairy eyeball. Okay? Like I said, all sin is social, and don't ever mistake it. The privacy of sin in the heart, that doesn't locate itself in the heart permanently. The fact of the matter is that there's not a day in our lives go by that we are not forgiven and that we don't forgive. You can't be a human being and live without sinning and without being forgiven. You could not possibly get through life if you were not a forgiven sinner. It's very interesting, the University of Wisconsin's been doing a study for over 25 years on the nature of forgiveness and, and re it's reconciliation, doing it in relation to uh, uh, to the law and people who are incarcerated and, uh, and the sentences that they give, but uh, the same holds true for, for us in our daily life. They find that a person who can make an authentic, heartfelt, real apology for something they have done wrong or thought they did wrong is accepted and forgiveness is mainly offered and it diminishes the time of anger, hostility, anxiety, stress, you name it. I'm sure you can see that at different times and occasions in your life. When you have offended or been offended, if somebody makes an apology to you and you get the sense they mean it, then reconciliation or peace has been restored rather than war occurring. That is the nature of both baptism 
in its repentant form, taking a time out, and its forgiveness of sin form, which occurs nearly every single day of our lives. And uh, part of the confusion that goes with that, one of the gifts, of course, that you've been given and what occurs, what we talk a lot about during the Epiphany season, is the gift of wisdom. And wisdom is the ability to differentiate between that which is real in your life and others and that which, and that which is not. Uh, it sounds really difficult, but, uh, but not so difficult because all wisdom is relational all the time. Uh, I was uh, reading a story about uh, uh, a young man who was, uh, came up to the bus stop and was standing there with all the other people and said, the name of the harlequin duck is Histrionicus Histrionicus. <laughs> and all the people there took a step back. <laughs> And that, by the way, is the name of the harlequin duck in Latin, just so you know. Okay? You're always learning. I told you to pay attention. The thing is, we all live lives of story, of events. And in this particular story and event, you can imagine that this young man, Histrionicus, Histrionicus, either has a mental health problem, which could be sad. He could also be just so happy because he got out of Latin class and passed the class. And that was one of the words he had to know, and he knew it. Or it could be code for the person, his contact, waiting at the bus stop, who is a spy. Nice. Take your pick amongst the range of possibilities. And you can see already, you have three different stories that you have written about the person, and you don't know a thing about what's true and what is not. And that, then, is where you have been given the gift by virtue of baptism, of wisdom, and creativity, and imagination in support, so that you can build relational wisdom with people so you can understand them and they can understand you and you do that best by means of listening to their stories they listening to your stories and getting a sense of what your lives are all about uh, why do you think the, uh, uh, the the negotiations between President Obama and Speaker Boehner, Boehner uh, on the fiscal cliff that's so stupid the fiscal cliff is just so <laughs> The important thing in all of that had nothing to do with a cliff. It had to do with the lack of the relationships between Speaker Obama and Pre or President Obama and Speaker Baker. <laughs> they did not have the stories and the time because of the 24-hour news cycle. They had no time to build a common story together. But what worked was the fact that they were able to bring in Vice President Biden and Senator McCormick, who had a history and therefore a story. It makes all the difference in the world as to how things will function and work in your daily life and also in Congress. Now, there's five pieces to wisdom, and I'm not going to be up with, uh, with long descriptions of any of them, but they're all pertinent to the discussion of repentance as time out and forgiveness of sin as authentic forgiveness and authentic apology and relatedness. The first thing that you need to have with wisdom is an awareness that there's more than one perspective that can take hold and may be true in any given circumstance. More than one perspective is going to occur. There's going to be a recognition by you of the limits of your personal knowledge. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been with anybody. I'm certainly not this way, a know-it-all. 
Well, you didn't have to be so good. <laughs> yeah. If you're a know-it-all, you're not a wise person. A wise person knows that he or she yeah. doesn't know it all and recognize further the limits of that. I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine who I never realized he never used a, a, an extension ladder before and he turned it upside down. That's a bad thing. Okay. It didn't work very well for him. He knew he had never used it before. Duh. He knew the limits of his personal knowledge. What would a wise person do? Ask someone who knew. A dopey person doesn't. You get the point. There are limits. And also, a lot of times, uh, you need to recognize an appreciation that things may, be get, may get worse before they get better. All right, that's what happened with this whole fiscal cliff stuff, which wasn't a fiscal cliff at all and won't be. It got worse before it got better. And that's going to continue on again for the next few months. But it, it's all going to be based on whether they all recognize their limits of intelligence and the limits of their abilities and the limits of their relationship and how well they can pull all those pieces together. Uh, and finally, a willingness to seek opportunities to resolve conflict. All of these are parts of what wisdom looks like in the Bible. And it is why people came into that river to be baptized. And I'll tell you why the final reason and the big one is is that in the middle of the Jordan River, we talked about this in adult class, the Jordan River was the entry to the promised land. It was not the exit from slavery out of Egypt, but it was the entrance into the promised land, which promised a new life, a new way of thinking, a new way of living, a new way of behaving, a new way of justice, a new way of fairness, a new way of being free and responsible. And so when people came into that river, they recognized that their spiritual life and their timing out also gave them a gift of the spirit so they could see a new life with a different kind of freedom in a new land. And that's the gift that you and I have been given. And the whole base and foundation of it is, you are mine. I love you. With you, I am well pleased. Even on your worst day, God is well pleased with you. And it is an invitation to cross the Jordan River and enter that land of promise and freedom 